Hey, what's up? It's Jake, and we're going to finish this uh, conditionals and loops section with a little Terraform gotchas just to go over all the little tricks and things you're going to run into um, ahead of time so you know what to expect. So um, it's worth noting that count and for each have limitations like I've talked about. You can't reference any resource um, outputs in a count or a for each. So if you run into an issue where you're trying to do that, that's just not something that you can do. You also can't use count or for each within a module configuration. It's all right. So let's let's talk about this. So let's say you have um, you 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 have multiple EC2 instances and you don't use an auto scaling group, right? Um, count is set to a hard coded value, so the value will work without issues. But when you run and apply, it'll create like whatever your count of instances is. So it doesn't dynamically know how many instances you have. So if you have three instances and then you um, like, let's say, let me just open a file here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So let's make a new file. And you can try and you can try this for yourself and see what happens. So let's just make like a demo.tf. All right. So if I if I made a resource of AWS instance, right? And I just name it whatever example. And I have an AMI, whatever my AMI is, and then I have an instance type is t2.micro and I choose to use count right when I do this what will end up happening is it'll create three instances right create three instances okay when I run uh, terraform apply if I run terraform apply again after I created three instances Guess what it's going to do? It's going to create three instances. So now your instance total is actually six instances. And if you're not, if you don't want six instances, this is one limitation of count where it doesn't, it doesn't know that you only want three. And I would urge you to use an auto scaling group in that in that case. Um, and this is all because it's hard hard coded, right? Um, you could update your code to fetch the list of instances. So you could do like a, a data source or something like that and then count the number of instances in the data source and then make the count length. Like you could do instead of count three, right? I could be like count is the length of a data source from AWS uh availability zones dot all uh dot names right so in that case the count would be three right um then you could loop it over each one and have instances created in each one so you can also create instances like i could create however many in all of them um I don't really know why you'd want to do that. Uh, just use an auto scaling group. But whatever happens, like I said, the number of instances unique depends on the output. Then you're just going to keep duplicating instances. OK. Um, the for each within a module configuration. So if, if this was a module, right? and I was just using a module named demo. Inside of that demo, you know, I have my source equals some get page and then my count is three again. And then I've got like a variable, you know, it probably looks something like this, right? Then what'll happen is the code will try to use the count parameter on a module to create three copies of the resources. So you might try to set the count to zero to optionally include or not based on some Boolean condition. 
But if you run Terraform plan, you'll get an argument that says there was a reserved argument. You'll get a reserved argument error um, because the name count is reserved. So you can't actually use count in a module. So when I said that you can't use count in a module, that's what I mean is that this name in here is actually reserved. So you you cannot use that. OK. Um, using count or for each in a module, like I said, it's not supported. Uh, maybe in future versions it'll be um, because they did say that they're planning on adding it. So depending on when you watch this video, that could be true or false. but. You can keep up to date with the Terraform change log and, and see for yourself. So uh, another limitation I wanted to talk about was zero time zero downtime deployment. So I told you about using create for before destroy, which is awesome, right? But it doesn't work on auto scaling policies. So it actually resets your auto scaling group back to its min size after each deployment because when you first deploy one, that's what it does. And then it goes and bases the scaling off of whatever your scaling rules are. So if you if you if you have 10 instances, right? And then you, you're like, oh, I'm gonna use a new AMI and you do create before destroy because you don't wanna have any downtime. The, the, the crappy part about that is if your min is set to 10 and your desired is set to 10, but your max is set to 50 and you're currently running like 38, well, when you update that, it won't destroy the auto scaling group. It'll make a new one first and it will load balance everything over there. But then you're going to load balance and start with 10. And obviously you need 38 because that's your current workload requirements um, based on the logic that the auto scaling group is using. So you're going to have a huge disruption in your application where you're going to have less than a third of the resources available, almost a quarter of the resources available that you had before. So that's definitely a little gotcha with zero downtime deployment. Um, there are a couple of workarounds. You can change the recurrence pattern um, in the time, right? So you could have it do that more frequently. Um, you could use a custom script that uses the AWS API to figure out how many servers are in the, are currently running in the auto scaling group, and then you could set the desired capacity. But that's also a little hacky, so. Um, that's, there's no plans right now, like immediately to, to fix that problem. But, uh, again, that's something that may be something out in the future, but it's definitely worth knowing for your zero downtime deployments. Cause I wouldn't have thought of that. I, I, I read that and was like, wait, yeah, that makes sense. But why? <laughs> um, the other thing is that you can run a Terraform plan and it would be totally valid. And when you run apply, you'll get an error. And so I actually haven't applied my um, staging environment in a little bit. So I'm going to, I'm going to see if, if this actually hap happens when I run this guy. So let's try to run a Terraform apply. First of all, you'll see when I do the apply that it returns a valid plan. So my plan actually would be fine just like this. So I have all these. I don't have anything built. It's building all everything. Every resource is net new and the plan looks great. Okay. Awesome. So if I hit yes, and I haven't applied this in a while, I've just been doing Terraform plans uh, and Terraform validate for my config and all that stuff and to refresh my state and, and whatnot. It's entirely possible that during this process right here, you could have something fail. Um, so one, one possible, uh, reason could be like that you're trying to create a user that already exists. So it's a valid plan. And when it comes back and it's like, I don't have a resource with this name. Maybe somebody manually has a user named Jake, right? And then you try to create a user named Jake, but because it's not in the state file, then it's possible that your, your valid plan will actually fail. So in that instance, I would definitely take a look at my existing resources and maybe look at doing a, a Terraform import to import existing resources um, to be managed by Terraform 
from that point on so that your state file has accountability of everything that's out there, not just whatever you code. The you're also though, once you once you import something, if you find something, you're gonna have to code it first before you import it. I made a whole section on import so you can go go watch that if you have other questions. Um refactoring. So we talked about refactor refactoring where you take the um like you take the internal details of code and then without changing its external behavior to try to improve like the readability or the maintainability or just you know the general cleanliness of the code um you should do that regularly but with terraform or pretty much cloud formation or any infrastructure's code tool you have to be careful what defines external behavior because um if you try to like rename a variable or a function to give it a clearer name, um, you might mess something up across the whole code base that makes everything fail, especially if you're doing like a module. So like in my case, I'm creating a, um, uh, a root module for prod and stage that call or import a remote module from my Git repo. And if I updated my Git repo, and I broke something by changing a variable name, well, I just screwed every single environment. So you have to be really careful with how you do all that stuff. Uh, apparently my resources work just fine. But um, so yeah, so be really careful about refactoring. Um, you can always run the plan command before you actually do anything to see. Um, you can catch a lot of things with Terraform plan. So use that a lot. I, I use Terraform plan and pro probably one of the reasons my apply works so well is because I'm always doing validate. I'm always doing uh, ter Terraform plans and making sure my state is up to date. Um, so anyways, that that's definitely something you should do. Uh, if you want to replace a resource, think very carefully about whether or not a replacement should be created before and consider adding a lifecycle policy to create before destroy. Um, changing identifiers requires changing state. So if you want to change an identifier associated with a resource, like rename a security group or um, a name of a cluster or something like that, you can, um, you can kind of do the same thing where if you add a new resource to your config and run an apply, and then you can remove the old resource from your config and run the apply. Um, you can kind of do the same thing by, by kind of applying the new thing and building it first and then running a second apply where you remove the old resource from your, your code. Um, so that's, that's one way to kind of like double apply where you're building the new thing on the first apply and then you're destroying the old thing on the second apply. So you can, if, if, so if you can't get around it with a life cycle, that is one weird kind of hacky way to, to get around that. Um, and then the last thing is some parameters are immutable. So parameters with a lot of resources are immutable. So if you change them, Terraform will delete the old resources and create a new one to replace it. So the documentation for each resource specifies what happens if you change a parameter. So get used to checking the documentation because sometimes when you change a parameter, it will just update the resource. But with some resources, if you change a parameter, it will delete the old resource and then rebuild it. So make sure that if you're going to change anything, you go to the documentation and you find out what the behavior is. And also, again, going back to Terraform plan, run a Terraform plan and read it and see, you know, what is it removing? What is it changing? What What is the plan, right? And read that and don't just run Terraform apply auto approve for every time you do something. <laughs> okay, and then... Um, so that's it for the gotchas, but it's also worth noting to um, tell you that eventual consistency is consistent eventually. So the APIs for some providers, like you see I use AWS provider a lot, um, are asynchronous and eventually consistent, which means the IPA might send, IPA, yeah, I'm from Colorado. The API might send a response immediately without waiting for the requested action to complete. So eventually consistency means it takes time to propagate throughout an entire system. So you might get inconsistent responses depending on which data store replica happens to respond to your API call. Um, so just so just know that even making API calls to to an external provider like AWS, as they, as they change things, that provider um, could get updated. So it's always good to also version uh, which provider you're using. So instead of doing what I did, 
which is just, here's my provider. Like I might want to put in, well, which version do I want? And you can upgrade your providers and a lot of other things. Uh, but I don't know if it's still showing in my plan. There's other places you can see it, but even in your plan, like it's not going to tell you what provider version you're using, but you can definitely look at it in your state file. So, um, if I look at my state file, um, you can you can come in here and look at everything and figure out, and this is my root one, but there's plenty of other things that I'm using, like version 3, for example. Um, so you just want to make sure that whatever you're using, that you're on the right version. And to know that the external providers change things, and depending on what version you're on, uh, or what data source you're getting your API call data response from, um, you could get varying results or even varying time to respond to your result. So with that being said, um, just whenever you whenever you async, use an asynchronous call and an eventually consistent API, you have to wait and retry for a while until the action's completely propagated. Um, AWS SDK doesn't really have a good tool for doing this. So Terraform used to have tons of bugs around, around this. Uh, with like, hey, this part of the network doesn't exist or whatever. So like if you try to create a subnet and look up data on that source, like the subnet ID and Terraform can't find it, um, you'll you'll read a lot of Terraform forums where there's like all these bugs and stuff that exist. But it's really just because of eventual consistency. So that's definitely something to keep in mind if you come across a problem and you're like, what are you talking about? This always worked and now it doesn't work. And it's like, well, it may just be eventual consistency. Okay, they're kind of annoying, but most of them are kind of harmless. You just rerun your Terraform apply and it'll probably be fine. So uh, in conclusion, for all of our loops and zero downtime and all and conditionals and all that stuff, um, just remember this is a declarative language. It's really like that's its purpose. So using like count for each four, create before destroy, like all those are those are built in functions. You do have a lot of flexibility, but just be careful with your flexibility um, because sometimes you can get yourself into trouble if you don't really think through, like, what does this do at scale, right? Um, but you feel free to go try, see if you can fix something, see if you can come up with a new pattern that works for you, and just use these to your advantage. And uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, let me know. But if not, um, I'll see you in the next one.